Hello, Mosaic. Hello, everyone. So good to be with y'all tonight. I'm Rosalind Smith, one of the pastors here. And I'm Brad Smith, one of the deacons. Oh, I'm Brad, one of the deacons. And my husband. That's why I'm standing so close to him. <laughs> Thank you for being on stage with me tonight. You look great. Oh, you look very pretty as well. <laughs> here, you can take it. Oh, I can take it? Well, yeah. well, whether you're forced to be here like I am, <laughs> or this is your favorite service, or you saw a yard sign or a bulletin board, or just excited to be here with family and friends, um, you're in the right place. Whether you're online or you're in the room, we're so glad you're here. Yeah, and you may have noticed a card in your seat when you came in. That card's going to tell you where we are in service today, and hopefully you received a candle also. That candle is going to be very special a little later on. So if you didn't get a candle, you can raise your hand and we'll get a candle to you. But we're so grateful that we get to gather together today. We should get started, right? Oh, absolutely. Woo! So I'd like to invite you all to stand as we get ready to sing together. Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to come together to worship, Lord. Thank you for this fellowship. We pray that you would bless our time. Thank you that we're all here together. And most importantly, thank you that you're here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So deep, no way. 
you and we exalt you we give you all the glory God Jesus you're the reason we're here we're here to worship you to lift your name on high to give you everything God in the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise for him. 
that you rose All of heaven held its breath Till that stone was moved for good For the lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was hard And the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth Voices 
Christ was born. Christ was born. Truly, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel. Jesus, we do love you. We praise you on this holiest of nights. Let your presence be in our midst. Let your presence, your love, let you inhabit our praises tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, Merry Christmas Eve to you. If you would, please take your seats. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite part of Christmas? Pushing up the Christmas tree. When we get to have all the food. Getting Christmas presents. Getting out of my room, peeking the corner, and seeing where Santa Claus is. What's your least favorite part? Last year, the tree was fake, and we could see right through it. My brother cries because he's scared of Santa, but I'm not. What kinds of things do you like to do in the snow? Play in the snow. I like to make snowmen, make snow angels, sled down hills, snowball fights. And then I like to skate, but it's really hard. I can't even do it. Whose birthday is on Christmas? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is. Santa's. I mean, I mean, Jesus. 
And where was Jesus born? In a tent, in a stable, at a hospital, in Bethlehem, in Oklahoma. What kind of animals were there? Sheep and cows, horses, chickens, camels, pigs, elephants, bunnies and rappers, zebras, dogs and kitties. Why do other people get presents on Jesus' birthday? Um, because they've been good. Well, they gave presents to him when he was born, and we give gifts to each other. Because Jesus was the gift from God. What do you think is Jesus' favorite part of Christmas? Just seeing people happy. See how everyone's being kind to one another. Probably the missions for all the homeless people. If you could give Jesus a present, what would you give him? A puppy dog. A snowball. A little bear, and he loves it. I'll give him one of my toys. My love. My heart. Everything I had. Why do you think Jesus came to live with us? Because he loves everybody the most. Because he wanted us to be good and not bad. He God's son and that was what God wanted him to do. And that way he could fix out all the problems that were happening. He felt like we were more important than him. I think he loves us very much. Why is Christmas so special? Jesus was born on that day. Because you share it with your friends and family. It's a day where we can spend time and we get to give presents to other people. It's about sharing. We get to praise um, Jesus. I love it. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. Hey. Welcome, Mosaic. Welcome, all of you. It's so great to see you here. Welcome to those of you who are in the hall today. Those of you who are at Mosaic Fort Worth, Mosaic South Campus, Mosaic Online. So, so good to see all of you here. And a special welcome to those of you who are here because you followed a link called atxchristmas.com. I'm Kyung, your Director of Connections. Hello, I am Elon Patterson. I'm the Director of Communications. And Kiyong and I just have a couple of things we wanna share with you today. First of all, Project Christmas. We wanna give you an update on Project Christmas. Here at Mosaic, it is our heart to share generosity and kindness through our community. And so specifically in this season, this holiday season, we took a couple of approaches. Number one, we gifted teachers at the following four schools uh, gift cards at Live Oak Elementary, Deer Park Middle School, McNeil High School, and Williams Elementary. Teachers and staff who are working stretch thin shifts got gift cards for this holiday season. Much needed, thank you. We were also able to gift 37 students shoe boxes for Christmas with gifts that they needed. We've also been able to give a Thanksgiving, a warm Thanksgiving meal to our friends who are in Mosaic Street Ministry, as well as backpacks filled with blankets and other essentials. That's been huge. And also, not, that's not it, the last one, we have been able through Project Christmas to give financially to our children at Casa Vallada Children's Home in Mexico so that they can also enjoy this Christmas season. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving. It's made a huge difference this season. So, Kiang, what else do we want to share? Okay, you love this service so much. You want to come tomorrow. But I'm sorry, there is no service tomorrow. Our next service will be on 1st of January, but once again, it's not here, it's online. Where is it? Online, online. thank you. At 9, 11, and 12.30. Please join us online. You can find the links on our website. So we are so grateful for everyone here today. What's, what comes after uh, 2023? 
2023? Wow, that is around the corner. All right. So I'll be on my pajamas next Sunday, but then the Sunday after that, January 8th, we do want you to come back in person uh, and join us for our services. We are going to be starting a new series called Miracles, and we are doing this with our Every Nation Global family. We are a part of a community of churches for over 400 churches around the entire world who are gonna be studying miracles with us. And so we believe that God is able and capable of performing miracles in, in your life, in my life, in all of our lives. And so we want you to come back with us. We're gonna study what the scriptures have to say about miracles. Allow me to just close in prayer even as we look forward to the miracles that God is gonna do in our lives. Father God, we thank you that, Lord, you are a God of miracles, not a God, only a God of miracles past, but of miracles to come. And Lord, we just want to realize that even as we seek miracles, we are really seeking you. So Lord, please reveal yourself to us. Turn our hearts to you, Father God. Prepare our hearts to hear from you and to receive the amazing things that you want to do in our lives. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, hi everybody, and welcome once more. If you're new, my name is Morgan, the lead pastor here at Mosaic, and we're, of course, thrilled to have you. Uh, whether you're, again, in the room online, Mosaic South, Fort Worth, Pastor Alvin and the gang, I'm glad you're here with us from the beautiful Clay Center there in Fort Worth. Uh, if you're here uh, and you're, uh, you're here because you're, out of town, uh, you're at, from out of town and a guest invited you, thank you for trusting that person. We really appreciate that. Again, from atxchristmas.com, thanks for being here. So thrilled you found us. And if you're here because someone promised you a December to remember with a big red bow on top of a shiny new car, if they promised you that, if you came tonight, I don't know how that's going to work out for you. Okay. Uh, but again, once more, glad you're here. Uh, I don't know what some of your Christmas traditions look like in your home where you live. Everyone always loves, of course, to talk about traditions at Christmas. They're fun to create. They're fun to remember, even if they're sometimes more fun to remember than they were to create and live through in the first place. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But one of the traditions we started a few years ago in our home was this thing lots of folks do now, which is the whole Christmas pajamas on Christmas Eve thing. Maybe some of you do this as well. And my wife, Carrie, got us doing this. And in part, I think she got us to do this because she wanted us to wear something fun on Christmas morning for pictures. But because she's so brilliant, she knew there was no way anyone was going to want to put something new on on Christmas morning when they woke up. So she wisely got us to wear them the night before. And now it's just fun. And we all enjoy it. And though, yes, she did take them, there are no pictures available for you from any of that, and you're welcome. But Carrie in particular is so fun and so great at making moments great. Uh, but this is something interesting about her that I've come to love about her, and I've really become a little more like over the years because of her influence, which is this. For her, when Christmas is over, it's over. Like, it's just, it's just done. She loves Christmas, but when it's over, it's over. Like, she'll give it two days, maybe three, but then it's all coming down. Like the lights are coming down. You're like, is this too soon to talk about? Sorry, okay. But, but it's, you know, it's all coming back in the box. The tree comes down, decorations go away. And everything goes back to the way it was before. And if Christmas goes much longer, like if it gets close to the New Year's, like two, three days past Christmas, I can practically hear her get a little fidgety in the next room. And now I know not everybody is like that. Maybe for you, you're the exact opposite. Maybe, again, that's you. Maybe for you, Christmas could go year round and you'd be good. We had this friend in the Philippines who posted on Instagram 
that she was super sad that she couldn't get her tree up and decorated this year until late October. Like October was late for her. But again, for a lot of folks, and maybe this is you, when Christmas is over, it's over. And the day after Christmas, you just kind of want everything to go back to the way it was before. And to a certain extent, the people who were there at that first Christmas felt like that and wanted that and kind of hoped for that. Because when the first Christmas happened, when Jesus of Nazareth was born, his mother Mary... And the man who raised him, Joseph, they had gone to Joseph's hometown, you may know, because Caesar, the Roman emperor, had called for a census, population count. And in that day, a census meant two things. First, a census meant that you went back to where you were born, which for most people wasn't a big deal because in that day, most people lived near where they were born. But it was a big deal for Joseph and Mary because they didn't live near where they were born. And number two, that meant that that census was really the Christmas gift that Caesar gave himself because the more people were counted, the more taxes were paid. And the more taxes were paid, the wealthier Caesar got. And so after the census was taken, after everyone had gotten to where they were supposed to get to, and after Mary's baby was born, everyone was just kind of hoping things would go back to the way they were the day before. Like, thank goodness that's all over. Thank goodness no more census, no more traveling, no more strange family from faraway places knocking on the door late at night with the pregnant girlfriend in tow swearing it wasn't him, it was really God, sure thing, right? And looking for a free place to stay. But for those who were there on that first Christmas night, things couldn't just go back to the way they were before. Things wouldn't just go back to the way they were before because things shouldn't just have gone back to the way they were before the day after Jesus was born. And even though the citizens of the empire, they may have been hoping for that, his mother Mary knew that they couldn't go back, wouldn't go back, shouldn't go back to the way they were the day before. And she knew that because of something told to her by some unlikely witnesses to the birth of Jesus that first Christmas. She knew that because some shepherds had come and told her because they, the shepherds, maybe like you last night, maybe like some of you later on tonight, Maybe like some of you, tomorrow night, those shepherds were working the night shift. They were doing their job late at night when most folks were just asleep. And to them, some angels had appeared. Now, don't get too worked up about the angels part. Sometimes it's hard for people to believe in angels. But let me tell you this, suggest to you this. If you're willing to believe already in a divine supernatural being called God, surely the reality of other supernatural beings is at least possible as well. And even while angels are here, yeah, a lot in this story, there aren't that many appearances from them elsewhere. The point is, this was special, and they were there to let the shepherds know, to let Mary know, to let you know, to let me know, and to let someone else we'll meet in just a minute know that things couldn't, wouldn't, and shouldn't just go back to the way they were the day before. And one of the angels said to the shepherds, verse in Luke chapter two, verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And so the shepherds came and they found Mary and they found Joseph and they told him that this is what they had been told and all of that sounded really familiar to Mary because that was exactly what Mary had been told because Mary, when she was interviewed for this story, which she was, by Luke, the Greek historian who wrote all of this down, she said an angel had told her the exact same thing almost nine months earlier. And over in in, in verse 30 of of, of the gospel of Matthew, he says, but the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. Sorry, Luke chapter one. You've been, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus. He'll be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And when Mary heard that, she knew. She knew that after Jesus was born, things couldn't just go back. They wouldn't just go back. And they shouldn't just go back to the way they were before because she would give birth to a king. 
to a king, which is what the word Messiah or Christ means literally in the Greek. Messiah is the word Christos or anointed one, like a, a king was an anointed one. See, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. <laughs> like when people use his name as a swear word, particularly in the South, right? And they work that initial H in the middle of that somehow. You've heard this, yes? I'm not sure what all that's about. Like it's his middle name, Harvey, you know, or Howard, or Harry, or Hector. I don't know. But Christ isn't a name. It's a title. Jesus, the king. And the angel, the angel tells Mary and the shepherds the reason that it's such a big deal that Jesus is being born is not because he's coming just to be an awesome friend to sad people, though he is, or just to be a nice conscience cleanser when you do something that you shouldn't. He isn't just coming to be your co-pilot as you dodge soccer moms on the way to dropping your kids off at school or practice. He's not coming to be a bumper sticker or a wristband theme or a tattoo or a piece of jewelry. That's all good, fine. If you want it, get it. But he's come to be king. And not only that, he's come to be a good king, the angel said, with good news. A new king with good news and good news of great joy for everyone. And here it is. Jesus has good news that this world isn't all there is and that we don't live in a closed system of only cause and effect. Jesus has good news that tyrants won't always win. Good news that the days of evil are numbered and that when we live under his rule truly and humbly we bring a new kind of upside down reversed kingdom into this world. Jesus has good news that when we live under his rule, people and cities and the very earth around us will feel its effects. Jesus has good news that despite what a mess that we are, God still loves us and God didn't move away from us at our worst, but he moved toward us. Jesus has good news that God didn't love us just when we were good, but God loved us when we were awful and wicked because, come on, anyone can love someone when they're nice and good back to them, like at your office gift exchange. But this is the kind of God who loves even his enemies. Jesus brought good news that for anyone who grasps this and trusts this and follows him, not just as a conscience cleanser, but as king, they don't just get a good life or a better life. They get a brand new life. See, And you thought, you thought not having to leave your house at Christmas because the Amazon magic truck fairies were going to come and make it all happen. You thought that was good news. Or you thought it was good news when you read that article. Should you trust it? Maybe, maybe not. That it said that the more sugar you eat tomorrow, the longer you live. Like that would be really good news. But that's not necessarily good news. This is, a, is good news. This is a new king with good news. Oh, but there is one problem. And maybe you saw it coming. And someone who lived through that first Christmas saw this problem coming too. Because the problem is that while a new king may be good news of great joy for lots of other people, a new king is always bad news if you're the old king. If you're the old king, and there was an old king, there was a current king that first Christmas. He was the king of the Jews at the time. His name was Herod, and not just Herod, but Herod the Great. Because Herod was great. Herod was a great architect. Herod was a great military leader. And Herod was committed to ensuring that his own children would remain on his throne. He had been given the throne of Israel by Caesar himself. And Herod was committed to keeping it. So committed to keeping it, he was so ruthless that he even killed three of his own sons and his favorite wife to make sure no one would betray him. And all I have to say about that is this, if that's how he treated his favorite wife, I'd hate to see how he treated his other nine wives because that's how many he had. But as soon after Jesus was born, some interesting people arrived at King Herod's door. They weren't kings themselves. That part was made up later by someone who was wanting to write a song about them. They were called Magi, and we don't know if there were two or three or 33 of them. They were likely from Persia or Arabia or both. They were super smart men who studied ancient texts, who studied the stars and watched for signs of divine involvement in the world 
through ancient documents and signs in the sky. And they saw a new star rise that connected it to the Jewish faith. They believed there was a new Jewish king being born. And so they went to where a new Jewish king would live, the city of Jerusalem. And they traveled to Jerusalem and they made their way to see King Herod. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, this is what they said to Herod. Herod the Great, Herod the Jewish King. Gospel of Matthew, they asked him, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. As in, we haven't come to worship you, Herod. We've come to worship him. And when you're Herod, Herod the Great, Herod the king. And when very wise, very wealthy, very powerful, very educated people like that say these things to you, you feel one way in particular. Verse 3, it says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Yeah. And of course, we know from history what happened next. He finds out how long ago that star rose to figure out now the age of this baby king. And he was so disturbed. He sent out his soldiers to do the same thing to some young Jewish boys that he had sent the soldiers out to do to his own boys in hopes of ending any threat to his reign and throne as king. See, Herod, Herod wasn't disturbed by the coming of a conscience cleanser. He wasn't disturbed by the coming of a co-pilot for our lives or the coming of a hillside teacher with free food in Galilee. No, he was disturbed by the coming of a king. Because, of course, if you're the king, if you're your own king and a new king comes into your world, if a new king, a true king is born, things couldn't go back. They wouldn't go back. Maybe they shouldn't go back to the way they were the day after the new king was born. So, with all this in mind, let me ask you this. Right now, the same question that the Magi asked Herod. Where is the born king? Where is the born king in your life, in my life, in our lives? Where is the born king? You know, I'd like to think, of course we all would, I would imagine, or many of us anyway, I'd like to think I want him in my life, right? But the truth is, I know my own heart. I know my own heart can be tricky and unreliable and false at times. I know it can betray me. I know my heart can lie to me. I know my heart wants all kinds of things to tell it. They can rule over it and everything will be A-OK. Money says this to me. Maybe you too. It says, let me rule you. What could go wrong? My intellect says this to me. It says, let me rule you. What could go wrong? My body, my desires say this to me. They say, we want to rule you. What bad thing could come because of that? My nation says this to me. People who look like me, maybe vote like me, say these kind of things to me. They say, trust us and let people just like you rule over your heart. What could go wrong? All of these want to be king. But let me tell you, They will all betray. They will all decay. They are all bad kings. And some of you, some of you know what it's like to be ruled by a bad king. Some of you know what it's like to be in a place where Jesus was supposed to be king, but he really wasn't. Some of you have been turned off, maybe even really, really hurt by someone who says Jesus is king, but they didn't live like that or look like that. And I want to tell you, all of that is true and all of that is real, but all of that is easy to see. It's easy to see, isn't it, when others are bad kings. What's hardest of all for me to see is that I'm a bad king. What's hardest of all for you to see is that you're a bad king. So can can I remind you now of something that I've hoped you've picked up on by now, tonight, or through this season, which is this, that the hope of Christmas is not a church or a pastor or someone on TV or the internet or the radio who's done something stupid or said something crazy or harmful or hurtful. The hope of Christmas is not theology or doctrine or a political party or a very nice website or cookies or Christmas Eve pajamas. (laughs) The hope of Christmas and in Christmas and at Christmas 
is not me and it's not you. The hope of Christmas, the hope of the world is simply Jesus Christ, the born king. So let me say this to you, closing this Christmas Eve. Unto you there is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. He came so that you could experience the good news of great joy for all people, that there is a God, that he is real, that he loves you. He is good, he is merciful, and he wants you to know him, and more than that, to follow him. And he has proven this by sending himself into the world, being born as a poor human, living, teaching, healing, dying and then rising from the dead in front of countless eyewitnesses so that you could know there is one savior for all peoples. He came on Christmas for you and 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 for me and for us. Not just to give us a better life, but a new life, a new life with a new king and a new ruler. Jesus is tonight the born king. And let me tell you, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Let me take a moment, friends, and pray for us tonight. We close. Lord, I thank you for this, for this word to us, the truth of it, the fact of it, the reality of it. And Lord, I'm praying for some of us, even tonight, this Christmas Eve, for the first time, like the hymn said, Lord, where meek souls will receive him still, you enter in. Lord, we'd open our heart and receive you. It's who you've come to be in our lives. Lord, a good and trustworthy king. You made the first move. You demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were far from you, you died for us, that our hearts can trust you and know that you're for us in the end. I pray we'd encounter the living reality of Christmas today, tonight, tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you for being here with us on Christmas Eve at Mosaic. It means the world to so many folks. We've been waiting for this day for quite a long time, and we're going to close tonight like churches all over the world are ending their time singing a traditional French Christmas carol. It's called Silent Night, and I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet here with me. I'm going to go light our fourth, excuse me, fifth and final candle of Advent. It's the white one there in the middle. It's called the Christ Child Candle. You should have received a little candle yourself as you entered in. I'm going to light this one. We'll pass the light and sing this song together and have one more moment of worship. Amen.
This year has been good for you or really, really hard. I pray tonight in this moment as you see these lights uh, in the dark that you'd know there's always light in the darkness. John chapter 1 says that Jesus came into this world. He's the light of the world. And this light was the life of all men, all women, all people. That the light has shone in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And I pray tonight that the light and the love and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ would be yours tonight, tomorrow, the next day, and yeah, in 2023. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you for coming tonight. We love you. As you exit just a moment, there's some cocoa cookies in the lobby, a special gift for all kids, I think, here, 10 and under. Hope to see you again. God bless you. Good night.